teach here periodically in Hunter College. Theorist. Um, we are very fortunate to have here today Ellen Lanmore from uh, who occupies an institutional post as associate professor of political science in the Department of Political Science at Yale University. And you may know that Yale University for decades promoted the idea that a modern non-Aristotelian political science was both, was both plausible and coherent. I'm not sure if it uh, does so anymore, but it did that in a notable way years ago. Uh, anyway, she, uh, Alain, uh, received her advanced degrees in political science and philosophy at the Sorbonne in 2000 and 2001, and then her PhD in government from Harvard in 2008. Her first book critically analyzed uh, Hume's view of decision making and was published in French in 2004. Her second book is titled Democratic Reason and features her distinctive account of epistemic democracy. It was published in English in 2011. The book to be published in a uh, relatively near future is titled Open Democracy, Reinventing Popular Rule for the 21st Century. The talk she's pre presented today and the one she gave to the Comparative Politics Workshop last week stems from a manuscript version of this book, which according to her Yale online bio, quote, develops a new paradigm of democracy in which the exercise of power is as little gated as possible, even as it depends on representative structures to make it possible. In this version of popular rule, power is equally open to all, as opposed to just those who happen to stand out in the eyes of others, which is a nice phrase, I think, as an electoral democracy. Her book centrally defends the use of non-electoral yet democratic forms of representation, including lotocratic, self-selected, and liquid representation. Professor Landemore is also the co-editor of books entitled Collective Wisdom and Digital Democracy, as well as many articles. In addition, she teaches, sleeps, eats, and is still young. Uh, just a couple of more professional, uh, impersonal comments. Professor Professor Landemore writes formal democratic theory of the best sort. It goes beyond the confines of historical circumstance and convention without ignoring practical realities or relevant historical examples. I open, also happen to like her work because she shares my arguments that I made in Democracy and Goodness that the consent of the governed, or consent generally, while useful in arguing against monarchical rule, in e.g. the Declaration of Independence and Justification of Equal Rights, is no longer sufficient as an anchor for democratic practice in an age where the power of money and the skills of psychological manipulation have made the ecstasy of elections opportunities for, uh, for the power of the few to dominate that of the many, as well as corruption. So uh, she will talk uh, today uh, uh, from the chapter in her book titled Representation and Elections, Legitimacy and Representation Beyond Elections, which is, uh, of course, a, a, a crucial and uh, very difficult topic because it's inchoate, it's not really settled. And so she said that she's going to provide a lot of uh, clarity and insight into this issue. So, thank you very much for coming, and uh, you are now on stage. <laughs> thank you, Professor Wallach, for inviting me and for this uh, introductory remark from our very generous and um, accurate and to presenting the work. So, I am delighted to be here. I, I think I'm going to keep my remarks uh, relatively short because I'm mostly interested in your reactions. This is very much a chapter in progress, and I and I'm curious about, about what you think of uh, this effort to pull apart the notions of uh, democracy, legitimacy, and representation, to try to, to deal with them separately and, and maybe make some progress in terms of what they, what they mean. So this chapter, as uh, was just said, is, is a central chapter. I, I, to some degree, I think it's the central chapter of the book, um, which is called Open Democracy, Reinventing Popular Rule for the 21st Century. And this book as a whole is meant as uh, an answer to the crisis of democracy that uh, we are all struggling with in some respect. And it's meant to be 
an alternative to two widely considered solutions, which, which I, neither of which I think are good. On the one hand, you have the temptation of epistocracy, you know, the idea that because our representative democracies are failing, we should therefore give up on the ideal of popular control, popular rule, self-rule, and turn over control and power to more enlightened elites. And that's, that's a sort of Singaporean or Chinese temptation, if you have those models that seem to work quite well, uh, and maybe better than, than the representative democracy we're familiar with. The other solution that I disagree with, although I perhaps I feel a little bit closer to, to the intuition behind this approach, is to return to a form of direct democracy or a form of assembly democracy, where supposedly by um, voting on a daily basis on all kinds of issues in a direct fashion, we would be um, able to self-organize and, and achieve outcomes that we want to achieve under our representative systems. So th that book is meant to be, as, as I said, as a, a third way, a third option. So it's a possibly non-electoral, yet representative form of democracy. I say possibly non-electoral because I'm not completely sure I want to get rid of elections altogether, you know, the, 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 neither conceptually nor in terms of, uh, you know, realistic uh, reform possibilities. But I do think that thinking of, of representative dem democracy only through the framework of um, elections is very simplistic and very reductive and very limiting. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to literally, you know, no pun intended, but open up our concept of democratic representation uh, so that we have more ways to include citizens in the process. Uh, and in fact, to some degree, I think the, the the main move of the book, I guess, is to say, look, we, we, we thought we knew what democracy meant. Turns out it's not working really well. It's not delivering the things, at least the way we implemented it, doesn't deliver the, the good that the ideal promised us, which, we, which was you know, uh, satisfaction of majority and preference, at the very least, uh, justice, prosperity, um, you know. So, if that's not working, is it the fault of the ideal of the implementation? And my view is that it's the fault of the implementation, and that we need to rethink the implementation. And in order to do that, we need to go back to the ideal and what it means. And I think my uh, definition of democracy, my, my, what I'd like us to go back to, the fundamentals I would like us to go back to are inclusiveness and equality. I think inclusiveness and equality in the decision-making process, that's what democracy means. And um, when we look at electoral democracy, we realize that those two values are not really fully realized. So uh, my diagnostic of the crisis of democracy, you know, that we're all exper experiencing, is that it's not, so it's certainly due to a lot of exogenous factors, a lot of things that have nothing to do with the political structure. That's to do with financial and economic globalization, um, you know, uh, phenomena like, uh, you know, movements of mass migration, terrorism, I mean, these are all uh, challenges to systems, whether they are democratic or not, and I think they, they are certainly complicated picture. But if we look at democracies as a uh, set of institutions, I think they have intrinsic flows that are responsible for some of the crisis, and so if we could at least fix that, then we could, you know, we, we could eliminate some of the, of the tension and the problem. So what's the problem with electoral democracies? More specifically, what's the problem with elections? Well, I think um, we've known it all along. Um, elections are based on a principle of distinction that ultimately reserves positions of power to the select few, to those who can stand out in the eyes of others. It's not a big discovery. I mean, Aristotle said it all along. We, 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 we know it, but somehow we haven't quite measured the, the meaning of, of, that, of that truth. Um, I think it's in part because even though elections have an aristocratic component, they also have a democratic face or democratic dimension, right? So they're not unambiguous that way. They um, allow everyone to have a say on an equal basis to the, to the choice of, of, of representatives. So it's a form of equal power distributed in the population. And it's, it's been, uh, for two centuries at least, equated with democratic power. But as I said, and as, as Bernard Manin, the, the historian of ideas, Bernard Manin said it best, um, elections are Janus faced, right? They, they, they have a face 
to, to turn towards aristocracy and if this turns towards democracy. And I'm concerned that what they do in current circumstances um, is um, essentially close off access to power to the ordinary citizen that does not have the, you know, the social salience to stand out in the eyes of others. It's possible that in the sort of, uh, in certain historic circumstances, the democratic face was more, was more um, noticeable, but right now what we're seeing is really an oligarchic drift that, that's really, uh, it's really visible and, and painfully obvious at this point. There's another problem, I think, with, with electoral systems, um, but I'm less, um, less sure of how uh, serious it is. It's the symbiotic relation between elections and parties. So in the 19th century, electoral democracy became a party democracy. And we know that electoral systems, party systems, depend on agents and virtues that are not conducive to the kind of open-ended, open-minded deliberation that people like me, deliberative democrat Democrats in general, think is central to democratic legitimacy and should be central to democratic institutions. In fact, um, party democracy rely and depend on a, a virtue of partisanship that's the opposite of open-mindedness to other people's argument. It demands that you blind yourself to the value of other people's views and, and arguments for the sake of one line and, and, and one set of uh, values that define your group, your, your, your identity for some people. So I think that it's an indictment of electoral systems and not of the ideal of deliberative democracy that they depend so much on. on um, so can we imagine something different? Can we imagine something that instead of restricting access to the status of democratic representative opens it up? two more people, and a system in which deliberation would be central as opposed to um, happening in, in the you know, uh, interstices of, uh, of partisan competition. So I propose to call that solution, which you know, uh, is, is more of a theoretical construct at this point than the reality, but at least I, I'm trying to create a space to think about it and think it. I call it open democracy. So it's, it's a form of democracy that is still meant to be very much representative in the sense of letting some people make decisions on behalf of others. Um, and the reason why I still think we need representation and we can't have mass, uh, mass voting all the time is because um, I subscribe to a deliberative notion of democracy and deliberation cannot happen in the millions. So far, we just don't know how to make that happen. Technologies you know, do, still do not allow us to do that. We can do it in the thousands, maybe. Uh, we, we can't do it in the millions. So if we can't do it in the millions, and we think that deliberation should be central to a desirably, uh, uh, normatively desirable form of democracy, then we have to go for a representative form of democracy. But it doesn't have to be an electoral form of democracy. So that means a rather radical break with the notion of democracy we are used to historically and conceptually. And in fact, when we say representative democracy, we mean electoral democracy. There's this complete identification of the two that I'm trying to, to separate. Um, so here I need to introduce a distinction also that I think, uh, I, I used to think was not controversial at all, but turns out it's sometimes uh, received with a certain Diffidence, um, the distinction between direct and representative democracy. For me, what it, the difference is, in the first case, direct democracy is meant to be ruled by all at once. Right? For me, it's mass voting, that's it, assembly democracy. <coughs> by contrast, representative democracy is where you delegate the decision power to a subset of the group, possibly with the consent of, of that group. Um, but some people tend to. Um, See the dire direct democracy as simply the, the rule of ordinary citizens, right? Uh, as opposed to rule by elected elites. But I think doing that uh, sort of combines together two distinctions the number of people involved and the number of mediations involved. And I think that's a big mistake because if you do that, you basically um, render the, the Greek model that I'm very fond of, the, the classical Athens irrelevant because it's it's too unmediated at the same time as, as being ruled by ordinary citizens. So it's an excuse to not consider rule by ordinary citizen because it was done in an unmediated fashion. 
though even that is not completely true, but let's assume the caricature is true. By contrast, if you say representative democracy is ruled by elected elites, uh, what you do is entrench the idea that mediated democracy must be you know, uh, ruled by elites, when in fact this doesn't have to be the case. So I'm trying to separate those notions so that you can create a conceptual space for representative democracy by ordinary citizens. I think, I think the number of mediation and, and the, the quality of, of the of the elites are, are totally separate questions. Um, so that's one, one first uh, opposition that I'm trying to, to, to clarify or complicate or maybe simplify um, in some ways. And another sort of dichotomy that I'm not fond of is, is the dichotomy between participatory democracy and representative democracy, so participation and representation. I think the two are not opposite. That, um, again, because I think you can't really, there's no such thing as direct democracy. In fact, that's a notion I want to get rid of entirely. I think it's really not helpful. Maybe you have direct democracy in a, in a small group of 12 people, maybe. But at the size of the polity that we are interested in, there is no such thing as direct democracy. There are potentially direct democracy moments, like a referendum, but there's no system that, that is viable as a direct democracy. So if we are eliminating that from our vocabulary, from, from our categories, what we are left with is a variety of representative systems, some of which are more or less participatory. And so my goal is to not just toward the uh, you know, representative systems that are participatory and involve ordinary citizens. So I prefer a different dichotomy, which is a dichotomy between open and closed. All systems that are viable are representative, uh, and if they're democratic, assuming that's the space we want to occupy, they can be more or less open. And I think electoral democracy, the problem is that they're way too close. They only let in certain people, certain characteristics, certain um, connections, certain resources, certain accents, etc., etc. And why is that bad? You might say, well, maybe that's what we need. Maybe we need a, maybe th there was a reason why we wanted elites, socioeconomic elites of sorts, or at least elites in the sense of people standing up in the eyes of others, to make it to power as opposed to ordinary citizens. Maybe they know more. Um, but my previous research has been all about how assemblies, uh, the, the capacity of assemblies to make good decisions depend more on the cognitive diversity of the group than on the average ability of the members. So I'm quite convinced that um, what happens in, in elected assemblies where the focus is on the individual ability or competence of, in, of, of, uh, of the members as opposed to the uh, group properties, so for example, the community diversity, is that you create a number of blind spots in the way these groups approach problems. And I think that explains, for example, the fact that, um, for example, in the US, the African-American community uh, you know, situation has not been good for the last 200 years. It's improved somewhat, but it's not great at all. And I think it's largely an effect of the kind of people that have been in power for so long. Mostly white people, mostly men, mostly wealthy people. So, and, and you don't have to attribute um, ill intentions. You could even have extremely well-intentioned people in power. If they don't have the experience, the first-hand knowledge, the perspective, the sort of, uh, 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 you know, if their, their, their worldview hasn't been shaped by the kind of local knowledge that only certain people can have, then they won't see certain problems. They won't be able to address them in, satisfactory, in a satisfactory manner. So I think that if, if that you know, argument works, then we have a reason to suspect that elected assemblies cannot do a good job of solving collective problems for all. They will only focus on a, on a layer of problems. Um, okay, now you might wonder why I spent so much time thinking about uh, assemblies. What about the presidency? What about courts? So I have to admit that um, my thinking in this book and in the previous book uh, is um, very much focused on the, the legislative as like the main democratic power. Um, I'm sure you know it, it, it's, things follow from that from from the arguments I make about the legislatives in terms of what executive we would need, what judicial system we would need. But I'm not really um, going to focus on that uh, here or or in the book. But I'll just say this as a as a sort of um, 
hint, if you will, of where my sympathies lie. I, I, I think the presidential function is a, a remnant of the monarchical ages. It's basically uh, the king function in, in secular slash democratic uh, clothes. And I much prefer the Swiss model, where you have an executive of, uh, I think, seven people who rotate every year at, as the head of the, as a, the figurehead of the whole country. Um, I think groups are a much, I mean, they're, they're a much more cumbersome way of making decisions, but also a much safer way to, to make decisions. And um, it's not incompatible with having certain uh, uh, emergency measures that maybe give more power to a single person if really it's needed, but I think uh, in, in ordinary time, I think it's to be avoided at almost all costs. So just to say that I'm focusing mostly on what I see as the, the seat of uh, democratic power, namely the, the, the body that makes laws and, and um, yeah, define them is, is the source of, of um, the legislative order. Um, so in this idea of open democracy, what's at stake and what's, what's central? So what's central is that uh, is the inclusiveness and equality of access to power. So as, as uh, John said earlier, in open democracy, the exercise of power is meant to be as little gated as possible, even as it depends on representative structures to make it possible. So it's an idea of democracy that is meant to be open to ordinary citizens as opposed to those who can stand out in the eyes of others. And the chapter I gave you is uh, specifically about conceptualizing non-electoral forms of democratic representation. And I consider three of them, maybe there are more, one I call lotocratic representation, and it's based on random selection, pretty straightforwardly. The other is self-selective representation, based on self-selection. And finally, liquid representation, which is an attempt to make electoral representation more accessible to more people and open up, in that way, the status of representatives to more people. Um, and I call this form of electoral representation liquid representation because it ends up looking so different from um, electoral representation that, that I think it's a different category altogether. Uh, and in order to make room for these non-electoral forms of representation, I disentangle three closely related notions. So first, representation. Second, what I call very awkwardly, I'm aware of this, but I cannot think of a better way to call it, democraticity. Maybe democraticness would be better. I'm curious to hear what the native speakers would suggest. And finally, legitimacy. So I think the reason why we are so wedded to um, electoral representation is because we tend to lump those notions together. And in fact, it's, it, it's, a, it's a natural legacy of, uh, of this 18th century moment when we, when we basically um, took on board social contract theory and so uh, consent at the ballot booth, at the, like the main source, if, only, if, if not the only source of democratic legitimacy and, and uh, the only selection mechanism for, for democratic representatives. So what do I mean by representation then? So I mean by it very uh, specifically, the act of standing for someone in a way that is recognized by a relevant audience. Importantly, so, so it's a descriptive concept, so not, it's not a normative concept. I don't lump in it uh, all the good things we would want to, you know, to have in a good representative. And what's important too is that the audience that is represented um, Sorry, the audience that uh, uh, recognizes the representative need not be the representative. So you can have um, you can have non-democratic representation. For example, you might say that Saudi Arabia, uh, sorry, the uh, Mr. Bonso now is called, <laughs> he's called is a representative of his country in the eyes of the U.S. with the uh, recognizing audience even though he's certainly not a democratic representative, nor is he, you know, arguably an, a legitimate one either. So I'm borrowing this very minimalistic definition of representation from Andrew Refeld, the theorist, uh, a number of articles that sort of made the, this, this clarification. He's, he argued that uh, representation shouldn't have to perform double duty in accounting for both how an entity can act on behalf of another and how it can do so legitimately. 
And I would add to this, actually, that I would want my concept of, rep of representation not to do triple duty, which is, which is actually doing my time. Because it, right now, in some accounts, at least, it's accounting for how an entity can act on behalf of another. So I can be a representative in a minimal sense. How I can do so democratically and how I can do so legitimately. So I think that's, uh, I, I think that part I feel fairly confident about. When we turn to legitimacy, I'm much less confident. Legitimacy, my experience has been for the last 15 years pretty much, that it's a quagmire, and every time I get lost in it, and I probably get lost in it in this chapter as well. But I'm not alone. I feel like, um, I don't know of, of one theorist who has a full, or fully convincing grasp of what the concept is about, what it means, and where it applies. What I find most, most plausible are the theories of legitimacy that see it as a continuous variable that is itself a function of several factors. And one of these factors, I, I think most theories end up always coming back to it, is, is a moment of majoritarian authorization. And by the way, majoritarian authorization is not necessarily, uh, and doesn't necessarily have anything to do with consent. Consent is something that, it, 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 it's got this mythology around it, but if you look at it closely, if I spent quite some time in the paper um, debunking it, there is no moment when anybody um, can really said to have been consenting to a given state. And even if a vote can be potentially seen as a form of consent, even that is questionable, it's never going to be the consent of all of us uh, at once. And so it's not clear why even a strong majority should have any binding force for those who dissent. But you have this problem of, of, of dissenting minorities that, that is really a problem for the legitimacy of, of of any entity or any system. But um, there are very good reasons to want to have majoritarian authorization nonetheless, even if it's not to translate, or transport, or um, convey consent. Some of the reasons are epistemic. So I am very much a believer in, in you know, choosing majority rule as a default decision rule for a group because we're maximizing the chances of making the right decision between two options under some conditions. There are other reasons. Um, so what are these other features or these other factors of legitimacy, of political legitimacy, beyond majoritarian authorizations? Well, I think that you could have um, justice, I mean, how, how well the, the entity is you know, meeting criteria of justice, um, deliberative feature, how, how deliberative the, the process is compared to um, uh, what it could be, perhaps. Um, that said, again, I'm not entirely sure this, this concept is, uh, um, that it's possible to define this concept in a way that will satisfy everyone. So um, I'm trying to have as consensual a definition as I can to show that ultimately this is, you know, it, it can mean different things to different people. But the point is, you could have um, a, a lotocratic body or a self-selected body or an elected body that have equal legitimacy, depending on your definition of legitimacy. So it's not something, legitimacy is not something that can only be uh, uh, attributed to elected bodies. That's, that's kind of like the on, only point that really matters. Now, what, um, what, are the, what, what, what is what I call democ democraticity, right? The property of having democratic credentials, if you will. And why do I want to, how can I argue that, say, a mini public of 500 randomly selected citizens has perhaps more democratic credentials than an elected assembly, mm -hmm. considering that no one elected them. No one elected consented to these people. So um, I define, in my own ad hoc way, democraticity, democratic credentials, as uh, the property of having two features, or expressing two features, inclusiveness and equality. Because I think at the end of the day, that these are the fundamental values that we associate with democracy above and beyond other related values like accountability, responsiveness, um, things like that, that are also very prominent in, you know, in political science, but I think are um, thought of perhaps better as remedial um, properties in cases when we can all be present, and so we have to ensure that those who are making decisions for us do it the right way. So we, then we, want, we care a lot about um, accountability and responsiveness. 
because there's always a risk in a, in a representative uh, system that the decisions won't match the decisions we would have wanted to, to, to see made. So I argue that by those two standouts of accountability, oh, sorry, of um, inclusiveness and equality, lotocratic representation and self-selected representation do actually much better than electoral representation, uh, which I think is pretty straightforward. So the reason being that self-selection, self-selected representation is egalitarian and inclusive in virtue of its spatial openness when you have a crowdsourcing experiment, say, or let's say a participatory budgeting experiment. I think in New York you've had quite a few actually. When theory, you can show up to those meetings and be an equal partner in the decision-making process. So it's spatially open to all in a way that, uh, um, you know, uh, joining an, an, an elected assembly isn't. Uh, so you might object, well, in practice, you know, it's another matter because, uh, as we observe, only a fraction of the concerned population tends to show up to this open democratic moments like participatory budgeting experiments or crowdsourcing experiments, and this might have to do with the fact that people don't have time, don't have the resources, and so it becomes a, a, a tyranny of the people with a lot of time on their hands. Right? And I'm very much aware of, of the, the, the danger of that, but at least formally speaking, there are no barriers to entry. Uh, you can be any color, any gender, any race, you can enter. So it's formally fully egalitarian and inclusive. Lotocratic representation similarly expresses a strict principle of equality because in a lottery we can all enter uh, and we have exactly the same chance of being selected. So again, it's inclusive of all, not spatially, uh, but over time. And with enough rotation and enough lotocratic bodies, you could, again in theory, have a certainty of accessing fundamental power. So if, um, if you imagine a mini public or um, randomly selected assemblies of a few hundreds at every level of the polity uh, that rotate enough over the course of election, you'd have a decent chance of actually becoming a democratic representative and making decisions on behalf of others. So in terms of intrinsic democratic credentials, as I call them, um, lotocratic and self-selected representation are fairly similar and, and better than electoral representation. Of course, if we start looking at more de derivative or instrumental democratic values like um, accountability and, and responsiveness or democratic, demographic representativeness, I think that we see more clearly that lotocratic representation gains the upper hand. Um, um, so my preference is for lotocratic representation overall over self-selected representation. I, I do think that self-selected uh, representation tends to lead to extremely skewed democratic, uh, to extremely demographically skewed groups. They tend to be, uh, at least online, very male, very educated, and so we wouldn't necessarily want delegated decision-making power to groups like this. Although I do think there is a room for them in terms of the deliberation process and the info 